Two, one, two. One, two. Check. One, two. Sometimes they're a delight. Yeah, microphone will say, have to say you tap also. I'm surprised that YouTube doesn't have a setting screen for that. I'm going to talk to Michelle and see if I can learn more. Two, two, one, two. I don't think. One, two. Two, one, two. And that's coming out clear then. There's a delay. Yeah, that's a direct feed. Okay. Groovy, everything's running right. I like that.
Did you want me to equip your slides for you or one of us for you to take a look at the slides? Okay. Um, all right, cool. And then, well, people are coming in. I'll hand this out. We'll be until about 12 minutes. People are going to be coming from both sides? Yeah, okay. it's going to be Right? Both in high body composition. 
transition to women who were um, not meeting the standard even then. And then if the division BCTs had pregnant women that were not spoiled, well, guess what happened? They would give them to us, right? And they would, you know, that's what the G1 has to do, right? You've got to back and keep up with the BCTs. So I literally would have about 50% female in my battalion in our brigade. And then we have to deal with the ABC program. We have to deal with a lot of uh, uh, pregnancy. I think at one time I was pregnant. Pregnancy. I wasn't postpartum either. So I think I had another five or six postpartum. I was MRC3 like. For every flight except for the reserve table was stacked. And I remember at the time with General Martin. Yeah, I got to see my one friend with you. So, let me, let me try to give you this, this picture. We're just going on the board and we're just going to bed. And that's how it was delivered because prior to that, it just seemed like somehow it's like, yeah, I have a lot of members who sign up because we're trying to get on the campus because we're growing our folks. We're growing our families. And this is what it costs. You know, so um, I, try, I try to spin it. Well, so I'm like, 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 I was walking down the path this Sunday, and I just, I just feel someone. Yeah, like, you know, it absolutely choked me out. Yeah, like, I was walking the path like And then the, and then yesterday, I'm just standing there. I get hit. Wait, he doesn't like, get his butt kicked by me if he tackles me one more time at practice oh, okay. and tries to oh, do okay. something. Okay. Well, I'm Oh, okay. All right. Yes. So, am I able to leave early? Have an exam. Yes. Sit in the back. All right. Yes. 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 Thank you. 
All right, as you come in, if you can go ahead and scan the QR code and answer the questions, that would be greatly appreciated. That's how we're gonna keep track of who is here. So as you come in, alert those around you to scan the QR code so that you can sign in, get credit for being here. If you have to depart early, we ask that you sit at the back three tables and otherwise all the tables up front are available. So go ahead and move up. Again, as you come in, if you could scan the QR code, answer the questions so that we can get accountability of you. Uh, and then we'll get started here in a bit. We're going to eat first, and then we'll get started with the more formal, formal portion. If you do have to depart early, make sure you sit in the back three tables. Uh, if you do have to depart early, sit in the back three tables. Otherwise, we don't bite. Come move closer, all right? Captain Clayton should be on that list now, so just refresh your browser. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, if you're just coming in, go ahead and find your seat so we can start our meal. When you get a chance, scan the QR code so you can sign in for this course lecture. If you do have to depart early, make your way to the back three tables. Uh, we'll get food rolled out here in just a second as soon as everyone's seated. All right, as we're eating, this is scheduled to run through Commandant's hour. So we're looking around 1345, 1350. Again, if you do have to depart early, I realize we had to move some people up to get food. Just do so discreetly out either the front exit or the rear exit uh, and continue to sign in to receive credit. But I would hope and encourage you to go back and watch the rest of the lecture that you missed when you depart early. All right, continue eating. We'll get started here probably in about the next 10 minutes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Again, if you came in a little bit later, make sure you scan the QR code. It will go away here in a few minutes to make sure that you have reported your accountability of attending. Uh, and then also, if you have to depart early, it doesn't mean you can't eat. You can still eat. Just make sure you slip out discreetly as possible either out either the back or the front exit. All right. We'll get started here in about five minutes. Thank 
All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Major Caitlin Withenbury, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as your PE450 course director amongst a great team of officers and instructors. Mm -hmm. uh, we're excited to present today's topic, supporting the pregnant birthing postpartum soldier and non-birthing partner. Before we introduce our guest lecturer, I would like to provide a little bit of context. So if you were one of the lucky volunteers that I approached before this, uh, as we started to come in and eat, Go ahead and grab your card and head to the microphone right in front of me in the middle of the room. Recently, as you're moving out, I asked a group of over 11,000 active duty soldiers this question. What is one thing you wish your leadership would have known or done differently while you or your partner were pregnant during your or their postpartum period and even now as a soldiering parent? In the spirit of putting a face with these voices, I've asked a few of you to come up and read their responses. So we'll turn it over to the mic in front of me. After becoming a father, I only then realized that I probably did not support my soldiers as much as I could have. I did not know how difficult or scary supporting a pregnancy was going to be or how hard the first few weeks of becoming a new parent would be. I also did not realize how my world and priorities would change instantly. Becoming a father has made me a better leader, but I wish I would have known then what I know now. So mine split into three parts. So first, know the regulations or know how to find them. Then leaders, be flexible and supportive. Every soldier is different and every pregnancy journey is different. Even with the same person, I've done fertility, been pregnant eight times, have three babies, had three miscarriages, and an ectopic pregnancy. And they have all been different experiences. I needed way more support with some and less in others. Commands should ask the soldier what they need, check up on them. What is good for one person may not be good for another person. And don't forget about the soldier's spouse and partner. I wish they didn't treat me like my pregnancy was a disability or a burden and that every body and every pregnancy experience is different. It is a season of life that involves growing and birthing a whole human. It is hard and it will get better. We just need time and understanding to get back to fully mission capable. Once I became a mother, I did not realize how guilty I would feel leaving my child, especially early on. It was really hard. When I went back to work, I felt like I was never good at any of my roles. Mom, soldier, wife, otherwise. I wanted to be the same hard charging soldier, but now it looked different. Please discuss how to help when a soldier experiences a loss of pregnancy or is unsure on how they want to proceed with said pregnancy. For example, just being supportive, judgment-free, and if they need help getting rid of baby items that were already purchased, telling or not telling the unit with or without permission, and then how to help the soldier and what resources can be provided, behavioral health, chaplain, ACS, MPLAC, etc. IVF and the journey for those women who have trouble conceiving. It is an emotional roller coaster for many reasons. Leaders need to understand and be sensitive that not all women can just get pregnant. Understand the IVF process and show empathy for those soldiers and or those soldiers' wives who are going through it. Recovery is different too. I didn't get back into pre-baby shape until my first was three. Stress, no sleep, crazy hormones, no time to work out. Did I mention stress? It can be so hard on your body. Don't forget about hormones for fertility and pregnancy loss. Be gracious and supportive. Support your soldiers no matter their journey. 
We joined for a reason and we want to stay, but being shamed because we do not bounce back or push through like some badass mamas is heartbreaking. It doesn't mean we are invaluable and a crucial member of the team. We have to learn how to balance the army and family self recovery, and that's a lot. All right, let's give it up for our volunteers. Thank you very much. All right, out of those 11,000 soldiers, I received hundreds of responses, and I'll share those with you on Canvas just so that you have even more context, maybe later on down the line, of what your soldiers want you to know about this process. All right. Some of these responses might seem pretty obvious. Some may be topics that we're personally uncomfortable talking about, or maybe we're unaware of or don't have any knowledge about. The focus of our course is fitness leadership, but we talk a lot about the potential physical training has to develop more than just our physical fitness. We can use PT to awaken our warrior spirit, inspire and, in and develop the climate and tone for our team, develop relationships within that team and between you and the individual soldiers that make up your platoon or company. Part of understanding our soldiers and setting a command climate that facilitates mutual respect and trust is listening from what they expect from us. And so hopefully you gained a little bit of that by listening to these six soldiers. Despite whether you're able to relate personally to today's lecture or not, you will lead soldiers that have families. You will lead soldiers that either will give birth or will support a birthing partner. Regardless of the way that your soldier grows their family, it will be a major life transition. And we hope to arm you with the basic knowledge and understanding to assist in navigating this exciting period of their lives alongside them. It is my honor and privilege to introduce today's guest lecturer. Mrs. Gina Connolly holds a master's of, a master of science and exercise science and is the founder and CEO of Mama Stay Fit an industry-leading perinatal fitness provider with a training facility located in Aberdeen, North Carolina, nearby Fort Li Liberty, North Carolina. Gina is a seasoned birth doula who supported over 200 births in North Carolina. Her unique experience of exclusively training perinatal fitness clients in person and online, coupled with supporting births as a doula, has resulted in the creation of Mama Stay Fit and an in-depth prenatal fitness programs. These programs support clients' recovery in a postpartum to return to their de desired sport or professional demands. And near Fort Liberty, that's often the soldiers that you will lead. Gina is a former Army captain within the military police, police corps and has served a combat tour to Afghanistan in support of operations enduring freedom and freedom sentinel. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Gina Connolly. So um, I think it's afternoon now. My name is Gina. Today we're going to be talking about prenatal fitness and how to maintain combat readiness using prenatal and postpartum fitness programs. There's a lot of misconceptions about uh, prenatal fitness, and so we're going to break down some of those myths. We're going to talk about how to approach fitness during pregnancy and postpartum. I only have an hour, so obviously my expertise from the past like eight years is going to be very condensed and kind of like an overview of it. So who am I? My name is Gina. I have my master's in exercise science. I'm the founder of Mama Stay Fit, which is a prenatal and postpartum fitness training company. Um, so we offer in-person fitness training at our gym located near Fort Liberty. Um, and I also offer a lot of online fitness programs as well. So I do have a lot of Army soldiers that do do our programs, typically postpartum um, in person because they have maternity leave, or they'll do our online programs if they're doing them at their PT programs. I'm an Army veteran. I was a former captain um, in the Army, in the MP Corps, with a deployment to Afghanistan with special operations. I'm a mom to three. My first pregnancy was when I was an active duty soldier. I gave birth while I was active duty, and then I experienced postpartum as an active duty soldier before I transitioned to the civilian world. My husband is still in the military. He's deployed right now to Africa. And so I'm going to share a little bit about our experience as a military family dealing with pregnancies, pregnancy losses, birth, and then postpartums, and how that can impact you as future leaders in the Army. So the first thing to consider is how does pregnancy even affect your fitness? The first thing that we need to think about is are there any complications that are happening within the fitness? Generally, if we're a low-risk pregnancy, you can pretty much exercise like you were before, and there are some modifications that we need to do. But it's important to know if there is a complication that is occurring, because there are some instances where exercise could be unsafe, but there Unfortunately, less likely. But these complications could also include more prenatal appointments, more intensive care during your pregnancy, 
And so these are things to be aware of for any of your soldiers, for yourself, for your spouses. The other things to think about with um, how pregnancy is going to affect your fitness is eventually you will give birth in some capacity. Um, even if at the end of your pregnancy you're like, I would really like to opt out, um, you're either going to have a vaginal birth where baby comes out of your vagina, you're going to have a C-section where baby comes out of a scission in your abdomen, um, you can have an unmedicated birth, which is really going to affect your recovery versus having an epidural, which is pain relief that is available that I think 70% of folks will get during their birth. So the way that you give birth can also affect your postpartum recovery, which could include if you had any vaginal tears, C-sections, major abdominal surgery. So these are things to think about when we are looking at our soldiers returning back to the forest after their maternity leave. And then were there any complications um, when they gave birth, such as postpartum hemorrhage, which can really delay their recovery after birth. And this is obviously not a, a full list of things that potentially we need to be aware of, but this could affect someone's fitness during their pregnancy. So ultimately birth is planned trauma. So this is a planned event that I know I'm gonna go through, not traumatic, like you shouldn't be traumatized at birth, but for your body, it's a, it's a force of trauma. And it's gonna take weeks of healing and recovery um, and probably like four to six months before you're feeling like pre-pregnancy again. And this is being a very, like this is on the early end of the spectrum for folks who had a fairly uncomplicated pregnancy, a unmedicated, no intervention birth with no real complications postpartum, roughly four to six months, they might feel pre-pregnancy. So just looking at myself, I've had pretty uncomplicated pregnancies, unmedicated births, no real complications. This was my timeline. Four to six months, I was feeling like I can go for a run again and not feel like my organs were going to fall out. My sister, on the other hand, also low complication pregnancy, unmedicated vaginal birth. She had postpartum hemorrhage and she is now and she's just starting to feel like she's not going to pass out when she gets up to go to the bathroom. So your birth, your pregnancy and your postpartum complications can affect your ability to return to fitness after birth. But we're first going to talk about the type of myths that are associated with prenatal fitness. So there's a lot of myths. If any of you have been on Google or social media at any point, um, there's lots of myths. Like if you exercise, you're going to miscarry. If you lift weights, you're going to miscarry. You're going to harm your baby. Um, and so a lot of the myths with prenatal fitness deal with, is this going to be harmful to my baby? Um, everyone has an opinion about what you like to do during your pregnancy, either exercise-wise, what you eat, how you do anything. Um, and so it's important to note that when we're thinking about these myths, are they based on actual research or are these myths that are going to limit our activity due to fear? And so I'm afraid that something might happen and that you will blame me for this happening. So I'm going to just say to not do anything to just exist. Uh, when you make it to the force, they may or may not still have like the PT3 program, which is like the pregnancy postpartum athlete. I think that program might be gone now. Uh, when I was active duty, it was you would just go for a gentle stroll down the road and then you would come back, which is not adequate for what we need for our fitness levels in the military. And just that was not even meeting the minimum recommendation based on like governing bodies for obstetrics. So if we think about all of these like don't do these lists, unsafe lists, never exercise on your back, never do core exercises. It's not actually telling anybody what they can do. And instead it's inducing a lot of fear, which is just going to deter people from exercising. And so if we don't give any actual guidance to our soldiers, to like your family members that are pregnant, they're just going to do nothing because the list of the don't do's is so long. And so if you just think about what type of myths you may have heard about prenatal fitness, it's probably like never exercise on your back never twist, don't do core exercises, don't go running and like don't lift weights. And there's a really, really long list of things to don't. And the things to do is like do yoga, walk, exist for nine months, which is really not adequate. So you can lift weights during your pregnancy. This is what our gym specializes in. We're a strength and conditioning gym where we have moms like this that are lifting weights that are more pregnant, less pregnant, that are postpartum. We have kids running all over the place. But you can absolutely lift weights throughout your pregnancy and it's not dangerous to you and your baby. So the biggest myth that you may have heard about perinatal fitness or prenatal fitness specifically is exercising and lifting weights will cause miscarriage. And so this is false. This has been proven multiple times in multiple research studies that exercising during your pregnancy does not cause miscarriage to include lifting weights. Another concern about lifting weights is if you lift weights, your placenta will detach. This is also false. So just understanding like this is the biggest concern that people have when they exercise, especially in the first trimester. They may have avoid exercising in the first trimester because they're afraid of miscarriage. 
And this is a big, this is a big event. Like this is a big deal if this happens. It could happen like one in four pregnancies. So it's a common thing. A lot of folks will keep it a secret because there's a lot of stigma involved with miscarriage. Like you must have done something to have caused your pregnancy loss. However, the majority of miscarriage is a chromosomal abnormality, which means this baby was not compatible with life. Nothing you did caused the loss that you could have done to prevent it, which is really sad. But because there's this belief that if you were exercising in your pregnancy, you're going to cause miscarriage. Now we have this increased burden on ourselves of, well, you must have done something. This is your fault. And so it's a really big deal. There's a grieving process that could involve with miscarriage. It can vary from person to person. Um, and this is a really big deal for your soldiers. One in four of your pregnant families will probably have a miscarriage at some point, and they may or may not tell you, depending on the type of environment that you're creating for them. So fortunately, or not fortunately, but for my husband and I, we had two miscarriages in between our first two children. And fortunately, he was in a unit that really supported the family. And so he was supposed to deploy. We found out we had a loss. They delayed his deployment. He's able to stay home for a little bit. And then for our second loss, it was a really similar situation. They delayed him so that we can spend time as a family grieving. Um, that would not have been the case in prior units that he was in. And so it's important to note that even if there's not like a baby to actually bury, there is still a grieving process that could occur. And so miscarriage can be a really big deal. Whether or not you know about it, you know, that's that's the environment that you're creating in your unit. But again, they didn't lift weights and cause miscarriage. If your soldiers are afraid of exercising during their pregnancy because they're concerned about this, you can let them know that this is not a true myth. The next one that's a pretty common one that I'll hear, and I'll even have clients at the gym um, ask me what heart rate they're supposed to keep. The myth is that you need to keep your heart rate below a certain level, which is false. Um, heart rate is not a great indicator of effort levels during pregnancy. For example, in the first trimester, you tend to have a really elevated heart rate. There's a lot of physiologic changes that are happening during the first trimester to make it better for you to transport nutrients throughout your body, remove metabolic waste. But in the third trimester, your heart rate maintains really low. And so with exercise, the same intensity level in the first and the third trimester will result in different heart rates. And so using your heart rate as a gauge of your effort level is not a very helpful thing to do. And so what we want to start to do with our prenatal workouts, and you can obviously do this outside of pregnancy as well, is the minimum recommendation is 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise every week during pregnancy. And that's like the minimum uh, which should be easily exceeded just from a normal hour of PT every day. Um, but we want this to be a moderate intensity level. So it's more than just gentle walks and prenatal yoga. Um, if you're lifting weights, we want to be around 70 to 90% effort levels for like the hard lifts that you're doing. This is going to be primarily first and second trimester. In the third trimester, usually effort starts to, or effort levels start to lower because you're just more fatigued. So it's 50 to 70% at this point. But it's important that this can fluctuate pretty greatly from day to day. So one day you might have a ton of energy. You can lift a lot more weight. The other day, not so much. When it comes to cardio, we can use a talk test to help us understand our intensity levels. And so again, we want to be in that moderate intensity level, one or two sentences before you get more winded or you need to pause would kind of be the effort level that we want to be at for again, 150 minutes per week. And so heart rate, not a great tool during pregnancy. If your soldier just saying, Hey, I'm trying to keep my heart rate before below 140 or 120 or whatever Google article they came across. But hey, like I feel like I'm not working out hard enough or I feel like trying to get to that is like really hard. Just let them know like we have other ways that we can gauge our effort levels that are more effective and that are going to help you tune in more with your body. So I'm going to lift weights at these percentage levels, depending on what feels good for me. And this is kind of the cardio effort that I would prefer like to do. All right. So most of the prenatal fitness advice out there is going to be based on fear. There's going to be a lot of lists of don't that leave the prenatal athlete with more questions than actual guidance on what it's safe to do. And again, when we don't give somebody like what to do, they just will be afraid of it and they just won't do anything. Like you're not giving anybody anything if you tell them just go for walks, do yoga, don't do anything that could hurt your baby. Because there's really not a lot of exercises out there that are harmful to your baby other than like throwing your body really hard against the floor, jumping off something really high and landing on your belly. Those would obviously be not great for your baby. Going for a run is not bad for your baby. Maybe not great for your pelvic floor. That's a whole nother conversation. Lifting weights is not bad for your baby. Um, so anything that is like a really big fall risk is like the big like don't with prenatal fitness. But other than that, there's really not. You can do handstands if you really want. Um, like there's so many exercises out there that you can do that may or may not be optimal for your body. 
but it's not going to be harmful for your baby. Your body goes through a lot of physiologic changes during pregnancy to protect your baby. You're better at dissipating heat, so you're going to keep yourself cooler a lot more efficiently. Um, so there's a lot of things that your body's doing to protect your baby. So it's going to be really hard to like do too hard of a workout to harm your baby. All right. All right. So why is exercise during pregnancy really important? And so it's more than just your pregnancy as well. So like I said before, for the majority of us, pregnancy is safe or pregnancy is safe. Exercising throughout your pregnancy is safe and it's recommended. 150 minutes is the minimum recommendation at moderate intensity levels. So doing that like 70, 90% lifting, the talk test of only like a few sentences or words before you start to get winded. Um, exercising, particularly lifting weights, which is also known as resistance training, can really alleviate a lot of common prenatal discomforts as pain, such as low back pain and pelvic girdle pain. Um, typically what we'll get is folks will message us or they'll come to the gym and say, hey, can you let me know the stretch that I need to do to relieve my sciatic pain or to help with my back pain. I want to know the stretch. Um, during pregnancy, there's a lot more movement happening within the joints, particularly in the pelvic girdle. And this is important because we want the pelvis to be able to get bigger to accommodate our big old baby heads. Um, and so because there's extra movement within the pelvic joints, that extra movement can sometimes contribute towards pain. And so stretching is typically not going to be the thing that's going to help you resolve pelvic girdle pain or low back pain. It's typically going to be strengthening because we want to increase the strength of the muscles that are supporting the joint to kind of limit the amount of movement that they're happening. Um, so resistance training is going to help to alleviate a lot of that pain. We've been fairly successful with helping our clients relieve pelvic girdle pain just with strength training exercises. And there's a lot of research to support that as well. Um, so it could lead to a more comfortable um, pregnancy experience, which again, like we're not just training for birth. We're also training to be comfortable for the nine months that we're carrying a child. Exercise can reduce prenatal complications. So doing aerobic training at least three times a week for like 30 minutes can like almost like have your risk of developing preeclampsia, which is a pretty severe blood pressure disorder that can result in seizures. It's the thing that it advances to is one of the things that causes maternal death. Um, so that can reduce that by half just by exercising a few times a week. It can reduce your risk of just developing gestational diabetes, which is where it's like an insulin issue. Um, it can cause your baby to be a little bit too big and make it harder for them to fit through the pelvis and also cause some complications for your baby. It can reduce the risk of developing gestational hypertensions by half. So just exercising like three times a week is going to reduce all of that by like half. If we have lower complications during our pregnancy, there's a less likelihood of needing labor induction, which increases intervention, which could increase the risk of a cesarean birth, which is a lot harder to recover from. So we can kind of see like the ripple effect that like exercising has on how quickly our soldiers can return to the force after birth. If they have a fairly healthy pregnancy, they're probably not going to need to be induced at the end of their pregnancy, which then could lead to more interventions and complications. Um, exercise can, again, reduce the risk of C-section and operative assisted delivery, which means they're using like a tool to help pull the baby out vaginally, um, which these both of these things are going to cause more physical trauma at birth. So C-sections, major abdominal surgery, if you have any sort of operative um, assisted delivery, it's going to be more damage to the perineum and to the pelvic floor. And so those are going to kind of increase the postpartum recovery. But exercising can make your labor faster because um, you can maintain upright position longer, which can then reduce like baby's ability or help baby's ability to move through the pelvis, which is obviously a lot more complicated than like or complex than like the two sentences that I just shared. But exercising can help reduce these risks as well, which again, means these are going to help your baby be born a little bit easier without as many complications and assist in your postpartum recovery. Um, and then again, yeah, it's going to help your postpartum recovery, make it a lot faster and easier so that you can return to the force faster. You can return to that four to six month time frame. So what can you do during your pregnancy? Uh, first trimester, we're there. A good majority of us will be very nauseous, super fatigued. It's like the most exhaustion you've ever felt in your life. Um, I was fortunately in a unit at the time that had very low demand. So I took a lot of naps during my first trimester when I was active duty. That's not normal. You will probably not be able to take naps repeatedly throughout the day. Um, but just know that if you have soldiers that are in their first trimester, if they had let you know that they are pregnant, they're going to be really tired. There's a lot, again, like I said, there's a lot of physiologic changes that are happening. A lot of those changes result in a lot of fatigue. Um, so you're probably really tired. You probably may or may not be super nauseous. It can vary from pregnancy to pregnancy. Um, but if you are not eating and you are not sleeping because you're exhausted, doing like a really hard workout is maybe not the best option for you at this time. 
And so this is where pre-pregnancy fitness is going to kind of carry you through that first trimester. Um, if you do have the opportunity to exercise because you feel relatively good enough, which can happen, um, we're just going to decrease our intensity levels to like 70 to 90 percent. So you should feel like you still have a little bit left in the tank when you're done with your workouts. But there's still going to be hard workouts. You can still sweat. You can still feel like you got to work out in. Um, but it's just going to be a little bit less than it was pre-pregnancy. Big things that we're focusing on in this first trimester is really focusing on main making sure that we're maintaining good form with all our lifts. Um, that relaxin or the thing that helps you, the hormone that helps your joints move a little bit more is really increased in this first trimester. And so if you have not great form when you're lifting weights, you're probably going to experience more issues from that. Risk of injury does increase because of that relaxin. So maintaining really good form during pregnancy is important. So that's why we're, that's really why we're decreasing the intensity level so that you can ensure that you're moving well with your lifts. But generally workouts look the same as pre-pregnancy. There's really no big modifications that are happening. You can probably still run, you can still lift weights, just decreasing intensity. Once we move into the second trimester, there's more modifications. The belly is growing. Um, we have to accommodate for, excuse me, for the belly. Um, workout intensity is still pretty high. Energy levels have really increased. In this trimester, your blood volume has doubled at this point. If you're exercising, it's up to like 55% increase. So that's a lot of extra blood, which means you have a lot of extra energy. So usually workout intensity may even increase from first trimester. If you didn't get to work out during your first trimester, um, you'll probably begin your workout program again. If your soldiers or you, if you're the pregnant person, did not work out in your first trimester, just know that it will be kind of an easing back into it in the second trimester. You might be a little bit sore as you return to workouts. So don't do what you did pre-pregnancy right away, like ease into it. Um, the issues of pregnancy, like the, not the complications, but like the discomforts tend to be a little bit more prevalent in this trimester as well. Um, so that's where like the pelvic girdle pain starts to become a little bit more prevalent. Um, low back pain starts to be more common. And again, strength training is going to help to alleviate a lot of these common issues that happen. Um, you can also work with a pelvic floor physical therapist during pregnancy. Not everybody knows this. Not everybody knows what a pelvic floor physical therapist is. They are somebody that specializes in the pelvic floor, which is like a really big deal for uh, everyone has a pelvic floor, but it's a really big deal for pregnancy and postpartum. But you can work with physical therapists during pregnancy to kind of combat a lot of these issues so that you're just, you don't have to suffer for nine months. That was something that I was told in my first pregnancy when I had SI joint pain or like a sciatic pain, I was told when you give birth, it'll go away. Well, that's not very helpful for me. I still got like six months to go. Um, like every step I take is painful. And so I figured out some ways to find some relief and then realized that that was actually not true. And that was really like unhelpful advice, which is very commonly told by your medical providers. Um, so lift weights. The next thing is that we're going to start to lower impact movements. So typically anywhere from like 15 to 20 weeks running will probably not feel great for you. Um, you might be that one person that's in denial and continues to want to run past 20 weeks, and that's great for you. Uh, wear like a belly band to help support the belly, but generally you start to feel a lot of discomfort in the abdomen, like maybe more heaviness in the pelvic floor. I would recommend near the halfway point to transition to stationary cardio machine or like swimming or low impact activities just for your comfort. It's not going to hurt your baby. It's probably not going to hurt you, but like I like to not be in extreme pain when I'm working out, and so if that is your preference – I would say transition to not running during your pregnancy. Um, things like riding a bicycle that's like a, a one that moves, um, not a, like a Peloton, their fall risk could potentially increase. So that's sometimes the reason why you're told not to like ride a bicycle, but you can do like a stationary bike. It's all about the risk that you want to assume. The third trimester, we have even more modifications. The belly is like much larger at this point. Belly size can vary from person to person. So it is a helpful thing to not comment on somebody's body really at any time of their lives, but especially during their pregnancy. Um, things like, are there twins in there? Or wow, you don't look like you're as far along as you are. Are you sure there's not a concern? Like they don't really make people feel very good about them. And if their medical provider is not concerned, maybe don't, just don't. And postpartum, especially if you know that they had a baby, don't ask them how far along they are. Um, all right, so there's even more modifications in the third trimester. So belly is really grown, and we're gonna I'm gonna break down a few of the modifications that you can incorporate for programming. And then workout fluctuation really begins to fluctuate within this trimester. You kind of go from like having tons of energy to like no energy, and it can be kind of a day-to-day -day thing. So for your soldiers or for yourself, if you are pregnant, you're gonna have to kind of adjust each day. Like, how do I feel today? And that's the amount of effort level that I'm gonna put into my workout. 
Um, you may start to transition from using like barbells or like heavier weights and start doing more body weight movements and lighter weights just for your own comfort. For me in my third trimester, I just did not want to set up the bar. Like that was just too much effort. And so I just would grab a kettlebell because that, that met me where I was at. So, so you can still exercise. It looks, it looks similar to pre-pregnancy. There's really not like a dangerous exercise out there other than the one that you're slamming your belly against things. Um, but yeah. That's the general recommendations. Obviously, there's a lot more. This is overview. All right. So common modifications that we're making during pregnancy. And this is going to be based on like somebody who's doing like a strength training program because that is my expertise. So the first thing is just making space for the belly. Like that's no brainer. Um, ways that we're going to do that are just going to widen the stance. And there's a few modifications that we'll do that I'll show you in the upcoming slides. We're going to accommodate for common prenatal tendencies. So during pregnancy, we tend to favor external rotation of the hip, so toes kind of pointing outwards, and we tend to favor an anterior pelvic tilt with rib flare, so we're arching in the back a little bit more. Um, there's a lot of things about that, and we'll talk a little bit more. Um, they're also going to think about protecting the core. So during pregnancy, everyone is going to get this if you carry a baby to term. You get diastasis, which is the abdominal separation. There's a lot of, like, fear about this. You might hear some, like, more, like, negative phrases about it. Um, what diastasis is, it's a normal adaptation for pregnancy. We need the six pack abs on the front to separate, to accommodate for baby's growth. Otherwise our internal organs would get crushed. So we need the belly to be able to expand. And the way to do that is the tissue thins and stretches to allow the belly to grow. So everyone's going to get diastasis. You cannot prevent it during your pregnancy. You don't want to prevent it, but we can minimize the amount of damage that is, that occurs with it. And we'll talk about like what coning is, what that looks like, how to modify for that. Um, yeah. And the next thing is we're going to just lower impact. Like I was talking about before running is probably going to transition to stationary cardio machine or low impact exercises around 15 to 20 weeks. You can still get a good cardio workout in. It's just going to look different and that's okay. So think about like intention for it. Um, it's normal to need to modify throughout your pregnancy. The, you should still exercise, but movement just might look a little bit different and that's okay. All right, so these are some examples of how to make space for the belly specific to lifting weights. So the one all the way on the end, just widen your stance. That's it. That's all you got to do. That may start to happen towards the end of the first trimester as belly hits the thigh. It's just less comfortable. Like, it just doesn't feel good. So just kind of slowly start to widen your stance all the way to, like, a sumo stance, maybe by, like, the third trimester. If you want to maintain a conventional stance, or let's say you wanted a hip thrust, we can elevate the bar. So this is going to decrease the range of motion, particularly at the bottom, where we have a lot of hip flexion, where the belly is really pushing into the thigh. And so it just makes it more accessible to you. So just bring the bar to you instead of bringing it all the way down to the floor. So for my clients that have more like back pain when they're lifting at the bottom range, we'll just elevate the bar. We'll just bring it to them. Um, and you can still get the same workout in. It just looks a little bit different. The accommodating for those common prenatal tendencies. So again, we tend to favor a lot of external rotation and more of an arch in our back. And so this position right here is going to be really uncomfortable. Bench pressing with your feet on the floor, if you're already kind of getting super hyperextended, does not feel great. It's going to bring a lot of strain into the back. It's just bring your feet up on the bench. Ta-da, you can still bench press. I also find bench press is a lot more, it's easier to do throughout pregnancy because I don't have to like, take two dumbbells and like roll onto my back with this giant belly. Um, the barbell is already set up and you just kind of grab it. It also helps you get down onto your back, which helps to protect the core. But so the thing with external rotation and that anterior pelvic tilt, when our pelvis is in that position, it's going to decrease the space in the back half of the pelvis or the pelvic outlet um, or that post. And it's also going to tighten the posterior pelvic floor. And so because of that, these, this is one of the reasons that um, postural compensation is like one of the reasons for the myth that, if you lift weights during your pregnancy, you're going to increase your risk of C-section because it increases tension of your pelvic floor. It's because that postural tendency is a power position. That's how we like lift weights. That's how we generate power by activating our glutes and extending in our spine. And so if we always favor that position, it could increase, make it harder for your baby to fit through your pelvis. So if you're lifting weights, just incorporate movements that also emphasize internal rotation and the posterior pelvic tilt, and you should be fine. Um, if you are thinking about pregnancy, I do have like a little PDF that tells you movements to do that's free um, if you wanted like specific movements. All right. The next thing is going to be protect the core. And so in the this picture right here with a yellow bra, that in the center is what coning is. And so it's this is a very exaggerated, we did extra lighting to make it very obvious. And so her two abs, just take it off. 
So her two ab muscles are here. And then this is like her abdominal contents, like pushing outwards. So this is what coning is. We want to avoid this when we are exercising. So typically what I find that to be movements that are overhead pressing. So you are pressing weight overhead because it causes you to arch in your back. When you arch in your back, you're more extended and that tissue is thinner. It makes it more easily susceptible to pressure changes. So arching positions where you're pressing over weight, if you're doing like pull-ups, that tends to cause it. And then like really intensive core exercises that are very focused on abdominal flexion tend to cause more coning. And so the ways that we can accommodate for this um, is to just adjust our setup. So standing is more demanding than a seated position. So sometimes we just need to move to an easier position to help manage the coning. Um, sometimes we need to decrease the range of motion. So doing like an incline bench, and then we can increase um, external feedback with, I guess I have an arrow here. Um, this half kneeling position right here. I don't know how to make it go away now. No, there we go. Um, pulling the band down can help prevent you from arching, which can cause that coning. So the thing that is like dangerous, but not dangerous to you or your baby, it's just going to make it harder for your, to heal your core postpartum is the coning. And so we want to minimize that when we're working out. That's like the big thing that we look for with coning typically going to happen with vertical movement. So pressing weight overhead, or pulling weight down to yourself. Um, and there's a bunch of different specific modifications that you can do, but that's what, that's like the one big modification that we're looking for. All right. So when is exercise not safe? Um, in general, it's pretty safe, but there are some complications that can be contraindicated for exercise. So if you have any bleeding, go see your doctor, don't exercise. Um, if your water breaks, don't finish your workout, go to your provider, um, depending on when how pregnant you are. If you're before 37 weeks, that would be premature. We would definitely want to go see our provider. If it's after 37 weeks, you don't have to like rush, but like expedite your, your path there. Um, if you have preterm labor, don't finish your workout. Go see your provider. That's not a good, before 37 weeks, if you're in labor, like it's okay. Go see your doctor. <laughs> Call your doctor. Um, cervical insufficiency is when the cervix is too short based on your gestational age, um, or it's essentially starting to dilate and open up like way before it's supposed to. Exercise could be contraindicated. Um, and then if your placenta is covering your cervix or if any of the placental cords and the umbilical cord are covering the cervix, that could be contraindication because if your cervix begins to dilate, um, it could be very bad for your baby. So these are like just some of some of the potential complications that you may or may not encounter. Um, there are some where if you have like severe medical conditions, like exercise can be bad, but you shouldn't really have a soldier with like heart problems um, or like respiratory issues, they probably are not going to be in the military. Um, their, their partners might though, but um, in general, there's these, this is kind of it for like what you're probably going to encounter maybe. Um, and with all of those, it's not like a definite, like do not exercise. It's just like a, you should probably go see your doctor because you, you've got, you got more important things going on than like finishing like your, your wad. All right. So let's talk about birth. This birth is a really, really big deal. The nine months prior, you've been preparing for this big life moment. You may have had like this vision in your head of what you want your birth to look like. Your partner may or may not have any idea what to expect. Um, likely, this is probably like your first time like being a part of a birth, uh, both for the person that's giving birth and the person that is supporting a birth. Um, the only births you may have seen are like in movies. And so just kind of think about that um, as you go into your birth. Um, so it's really easy to dismiss the gravity of this life event, of life event because it's inconvenient. Like having to put you on a profile and like not, you can't be deployable for like nine plus months and then like postpartum, it's inconvenient to the unit. Like it's, it's like, but it's still a really big deal. Like the only way, like we need, we, we a lot of us want to have children and this is a big life event. Like it would be unrealistic to say like none of our soldiers can have kids because it's inconvenient to our mission. Like we need our people to be happy in order to accomplish our mission. And so when you're going through pregnancy, there's a lot of appointments that you may be going to. Typically in like the first two trimesters, it's like once a month is the appointment. Um, and then as you enter the third trimester, it's like every other week. And then in the last month, it's like every week. And then depending on if you have any sort of complications, it may be more frequent than that. So the really big appointment would be like the 20 week anatomy scan. This is when like a lot of folks will find out like the gender of their baby. And they also may find out if there's any sort of issues with their pregnancy. Um, so like, this is an important one to like be aware of as a, as a leader of like, Hey, they have, they're coming up on their 20 weeks. You can do this scan before 20 weeks. Like you can be like 18 weeks and you can be up to like 26 or 28 weeks. So it's kind of like a window. 
But I would say like asking when is your 20 week anatomy scan and then asking them how they how it went. Like, are you going to find out your baby's gender? And they might be like, oh, we're going to wait till birth. And then you can just chit chat about that. So that would be like the one big appointment during pregnancy. Um, it's like they, if you also, it's also important to know if there's a complication because this is going to help to, this is probably going to increase the number of appointments that they have to go to. And so for those of you that are partners, it can be helpful to go to the appointment so that you know what is going on during the pregnancy, that you can be an active part of the preparation for the birth. Um, something that I find for a lot of my friends and for a lot of my clients is that their partners are either super involved and they're reading all the books and the articles and they want to be like the best support person for them. Or they're like, just tell me what to do and I'll just do that. Like, that's not, don't, don't be that. Be the person that's like really interested in the experience because it's also your child. It's not my baby. It's our baby. Not ours, but like me and my husband's baby. <laughs> um, my husband gets really upset when I'm like my children. He's like our children. But he was a very active part of our pregnancies and our births. Um, and so as a leader, it can be helpful. Like, hey, like, would you like to go to the appointments with your partner, with your spouse? Like, be a nice little bonding moment for the two of you or like if you have other children and you need some like there's limitations on like people that can be at appointments can can I go watch my other kids while my partner goes to her appointment instead of having to figure out child care um, so just just be aware that they have appointments that they may or may not want to be a part of um, labor can also take a really long time it's um, time is magic it can be days it can be like 30 minutes um, and it can also be really confusing. It's probably your first time, even if it's not my, I've given birth three times and every time I'm like, is this it? I don't know. Um, and so it, there can be false alarms. Someone might have to leave work thinking like a baby's about to fall out and then they come back the next day and they're like, JK, still pregnant. Um, so just, just be okay with that flexibility at the end. Like it can be really confusing what's going on. If their uh, wife is 38 weeks pregnant, don't send them to the field. It can be super stressful. Just don't do that, please. Um, and like last minute tasks. So thinking about like what needs to be accomplished, like before, like their baby is born, like what can we kind of delegate to somebody else instead? Um, and then deployments can be another big thing. Like obviously like the mission still comes first. Like we still have to do the things that we have to do. We can't expect everyone to like put everything on pause because somebody's having a baby. Um, but like, if you only have a single point of failure, like we might have some other things to consider within the way that we are organizing our system. Um, and then another thing that I thought was always really nice was welcoming the baby to the unit. Some of the units that we were in, um, they would give us like a little onesie, one unit sent us some flowers. And so it just kind of helped us feel like they cared about the fact that we had had a baby. Um, and we had had very different experiences in different units with pregnancy and postpartum. We were in one unit where um, this was when the army only had 10 paternity or 10 days of leave for um, the male partner. And they counted our four days in the hospital. Then it was a four day weekend. And so we couldn't do any of the admin stuff that you have to do after baby is born, like wow. register them in deers. Um, and then he went back to work like two days later because his boss said, well, I wasn't even at my child's birth. Therefore, you should just be happy that you were there. Not super welcoming. Not, not a great vibe. Not a great vibe. Um, while his subsequent units, they were like, hey, we don't really got a lot going on. If you want to like hang out at home for a little bit before the baby's born, or you want to make sure you can go to the appointments, like we totally support that. And then after baby was born, like, hey, you got your, I think it's six weeks at that time. No, three weeks um, at the time, like take the time. If we need you, we'll give you a call. But otherwise, like just focus on you and your baby. Really different vibe. And it like really supported us as a family. It helped me in the early days, like mentally to have someone there to, to help me with the baby. Um, so just think about the transition. It sometimes takes a little bit longer than we think. All right, so for partners, it can be really helpful to be involved in the prenatal process, um, read the books, care, like try to understand what's going on. There's childbirth educations out there that you can take to better understand how to support each other. And then for leaders, like allow your soldiers, give them the space to be an active part of their pregnancies and births. Like this is a really big deal. Like, like, like that. Oh, shit. Sorry. Um, like this over here, like this was our... This was our birth and my husband got to be a big active part of it because we had done so much preparation for it. And so, and that was like a really big moment for us as a family. And so like your soldiers maybe not want it to look like that, but they all want that too for themselves. They want to feel like they are connected with their spouse as they're welcoming their baby into the world. And I'm sure a lot of you probably, maybe not that exact picture, but you want that vibe. You want that vibe. 
All right, so now that we've gone through birth, postpartum, what can we do postpartum? And what I tend to find is during pregnancy, we think like we can do nothing. And then postpartum, we need to like jump back as fast as possible. Like we need to bounce back or whatever other phrases you may have heard. Um, but we need to remember that birth is planned trauma. And so we have to recover from birth. There's been a lot of structural changes that happen during our pregnancies, a lot of physiologic changes that have happened. And then birth is, is physically traumatic. Um, to start, your placenta, which is the organ that you grow during your pregnancy, has to detach from the uterine wall and it leaves a very large wound internally. And so if I was bleeding internally from this hole, I would probably not be like, let me go for a run. That sounds, no, that's a bad idea. Don't do that. Um, so we just need to heal. And this first healing process before that placenta totally scabs over takes about a week. So that's like minimum. Do not go for a run at one week postpartum. That is a bad idea. You will not feel good. Um, and so this can take several weeks just to initially heal from this initial bleeding. You also lose birth at, you don't lose birth, you lose blood at birth. Um, there's trauma to your pelvic floor after you give birth. If you give birth vaginally, it stretches a lot to accommodate, it's wild, uh, to accommodate for a baby head to emerge. Um, and C-section is a major abdominal surgery. Like you would not have knee surgery and be like, oh, let me go for a run. No, don't do that. Um, so bleeding can last for about four to six weeks after birth, sometimes a little bit longer, depending on how your birth was, sometimes a little bit shorter. So um, you will have like more heavy bleeding for about like a week or so. Um, and then it'll kind of be more like spotting um, type bleeding. And what I would definitely recommend is to not resume structured exercise before your bleeding stops. Like you still bleeding is a sign that you were still very much in that initial recovery phase. Um, and so, but four to six weeks can be a long time. And you might be like, oh my God, like there's so many things that I need to do. I need to get back to take my APFT. Um, but take the time during this phase to recover and you will feel much, you will feel much stronger postpartum. If you rush this process, you're just going to have more complications. They're going to kind of hinder your recovery long-term. So early postpartum, what can you do then? Like you've got four to six weeks, to just hang out with your baby. Um, first, we're just focusing on reconnection and tissue healing. So this is going to be like breathing drills. So I'm just focusing on moving my diaphragm and my pelvic floor in unison. And that's it. That's all I'm doing at first. And this is allowing me to reconnect with my core and my pelvic floor. Super simple. I have clients that hate me when I'm like, please just breathe. Don't go to the gym. Um, you can do mobility exercise like thoracic mobility, hips, shoulders, just moving your body in general can feel really good. You can do like very gentle core exercises. If you just Google gentle core exercises, there'll be a ton that you can do. Um, just like you're just starting to reconnect with your body. And this could take about a month. Um, and then you can also do like really short walks. Do not go for a five mile walk. Do like 400 meters. Like that's maybe walk to your mailbox and back. Um, and this can all be delayed if you have complications at birth too. So if you do have a hemorrhage, this is going to be all a little bit delayed. This is going to take a little bit longer because we're just recovering. So being patient postpartum is really important. Now, once you can return to fitness, your structured exercise, what does that even look like? Um, so this is typically no earlier than four weeks postpartum um, when your bleeding has stopped, but it could take a little bit longer depending on your pregnancy, depending on your birth. Um, if you've had a C-section, we also want to incorporate scar mobilization, which is sometimes not told to folks that have cesarean births. And so if you have a soldier that has had a cesarean birth or they have told you that you've had a, they've had a C-section, try to inform them about scar mobilization. If you don't know what that is, say, hey, like you should definitely connect with a physical therapist or like a massage therapist to learn how to mobilize your scar. So when you have a C-section, it cuts through seven layers. And what we want is those layers to glide over one another as we move. That's how we want all our tissue layers to do. When we have a C-section or we have any sort of trauma to the tissue, it gets really sticky and then it could kind of adhere to itself. So you might have sensations of like pulling, they might have like a lot of low back pain, they may feel that they have a hard time like turning on their abs and it's because of scar mobilization or the lack thereof. Um, so incorporating that can really make a huge difference in our, our soldiers or for ourselves if we've had a C-section. So that's something like that's really big that I would say like, if you know that anyone's had one, ask them to do that. Um, if you've had postpartum hemorrhage, again, loss of blood loss, it's going to take a lot longer for you to recover from that. Um, and so it's okay if the start to your recovery is a little bit delayed. It's, it'll be fine. Um, when you first start to return to lifting or to movement, we want to start baby steps. Think like you're, you're starting, you are relearning how to do everything. And so we're thinking about what are the basic movement patterns in this lift? Um, so we think about like a deadlift, it's a hinge type movement where we have flexion at the hips and the knee, and then we have extension. 
And so we can start with like a kneeling deadlift. So we're relearning movement pattern in just a few of the joints. We're relearning how to stabilize and to manage pressure in our abdominals. Um, and then we just like kind of slowly progression there. Like, okay, now I'm going to deadlift the bar from an elevated position. Okay, now I'm going to lower that position a little bit more. And now I'm going to lower it to the floor. And you just kind of slowly progress over a period of like two to three months. And then eventually you're kind of back to what you're doing before. If we're trying to get back to like running, when you are, I think it's the next slide. Um, to get back to running, it's usually like 12 to 16 weeks is when you will probably feel ready to start running. But before that, you can start to incorporate some impact. So like an introduction to impact, like maybe some hopping, some little like taps and stuff here and there. Uh, when you do start running around that 12 to 16 week mark, and again, that's a long time. Like, um, I don't know if it's still the same, but like when I was in the army, if you could run really fast, like you were like gold, like you could do whatever you wanted. Um, and so like, there could be a lot of pressure to like get back to running really fast, but it takes time. Like if you rush this, you will not feel good in your body and you will probably have more issues long-term. Um, so when you return to running, think like 30 seconds, run, walk for a minute, 30 seconds, walk, run, or walk for a minute. Um, and just do that 10 times. So we're kind of like slowly building the volume. And then eventually you can go run for that five miles. Um, don't go running two miles at six weeks postpartum. It's not, it doesn't, it's not going to feel good. If you do it and you're like, I felt fine. You're lying. Um, you will probably not be maxing lifts at four months postpartum. It's okay. It's probably going to be closer to like a six to nine month time frame. Um, and it's a very patient and frustrating process, but it is worth it to be patient with it because we are, you will probably like learn out, learn any sort of issues that you've had pre-pregnancy. So for me personally, like I considered myself a high level, like performing person before I gave birth or before I had a baby and after I gave birth, but I had a lot of aches and pains. I had like really bad hip pain. I had this weird shoulder pain. Um, and it was because I had poor movement habits that I was just like pushing through. Cause I was like, I can do this fine. Um, once I gave birth and I was postpartum, I like retaught myself all of my movement patterns. I was able to kind of like outlearn these poor movement habits that I had. And now I don't really have a lot of like aches and pains. Um, I'm stronger than I was pre-pregnancy. I've had three kids. Um, I run faster, not that much faster, but I run faster than I did before I gave birth. I was a collegiate runner, so I'm not as fast as them. But now I'm faster than I was pre-pregnancy because I was very patient with my healing process after birth. I was very deliberate with my fitness during my pregnancy. Like you don't have to not work out because it's just going to make you, it's going to make it harder for you to return to the force. All right. So emotional considerations. Um, a brand new human is a really big deal. They're really cute. They do a lot of things, but it can be really hard to leave them at home and go back to work. Um, I think it's probably one of the hardest things that somebody can do. And I think there's a lot of like encouragement that needs to come with that. Um, there's this desire to both be a soldier and to be a mother. And sometimes it's hard to be both and feel like you're kind of failing at both. So just acknowledge that as a partner, acknowledge that for yourself, um, as a leader, just know that it's really hard for someone to leave their child. Um, if you have somebody that is choosing to breastfeed, know that you need to provide an environment for them to do that. So like, obviously they're not going to bring their baby to work, but they need to be able to pump. So they need a space where there's an outlet for them to plug their pump into that's private. That doesn't feel inconvenient to everybody else. Cause sometimes like, I mean, I think there's like a, a rule now where you have to have a lactation room for your breastfeeding soldier. But like, if it's like this really big deal and everyone's like, this is super inconvenient for us to have to make this space for them. Like just, it's, it's just not very helpful for them. And they're probably going to stop breastfeeding. I um, mean, there's lots of benefits to breastfeeding um, if you want to. For those of you that are planning to give birth, your body is going to look a little bit different. Um, and there may be this really big desire to bounce back. Like there's this whole societal thing about like as women, we need to be as small as possible. Um, that can be a whole different conversation. But knowing that trying to like rush your healing process is going to cause more issues for you. And so something that I'll, like, I'll usually mention to my clients that are like, I really just want to lose a lot of weight is I'll ask them like, well, what will this weight loss bring you that you can't have now? Like what, what is only attainable for you at a smaller size? And once they kind of understand like, well, I can still be loved and I'm still valuable as a person and I can still function and do all the things that I want to do. Then the process of like losing weight, if that's their desire, is just a lot more positive as opposed to like, I can only be loved only valued as a person or as a soldier if I'm smaller. Like that's not, it's not a good approach to our fitness. Um, starving yourself is probably not going to equal weight loss because we need fuel to, to work out. And a lot of our muscular gain is made in the recovery. So eating less does not always equate weight loss either. And then ultimately your body is not your value as a person. Um, so focus on performance goals. So instead of saying like, I want to lose 20 pounds, like whatever that means, 
think, hey, I want to lift 100 pounds or I want to lift 200 pounds and focus on that goal because it's objective. And you kids like plan that like our weight fluctuates throughout the day. So it's really hard to say I want to lose five pounds. Um, and if your partner is struggling with body image after birth, um, just focus on the things that they are doing for you as opposed to like, no, you look fine. Like, like as they're like trying to squeeze themselves into their jeans, that they don't need to be wearing. Um, just focus on the things that they're providing for you, the things that they have done for you. Like um, I had one of my friends whose husband was like, um, you know, I'm just so thankful that you have you brought me my children and the, all the things that you're doing for our children. And so just kind of focusing on like their accomplishments as like a mother can be more helpful than like, here's a weight loss program or you look exactly the same and fine. Um, and then um, if you're having issues postpartum returning to fitness or mentally, there are a lot of professionals out there and these are good resources to have available to you as a leader. So you can have physical therapists. There are pelvic floor physical therapists that specialize kind of in the perinatal time frame. Uh, working with like mental health therapists, if like someone is struggling a little bit more with like postpartum depression, um, that might be something that is less apparent to you as a leader because a lot of that um, complications with postpartum depression happen like within the early time frame. So you may or may not be exposed to them. But for you as partners, like being aware of the signs can be pretty impactful um, in helping someone recover. All right. So in conclusion, the perinatal time frame is a really big deal to our soldiers giving birth. Like having babies is a really big deal. Um, we like to dismiss the importance of it because it's inconvenient. Um, and it being inconvenient is not a reason to pretend like growing an entire human is not a big deal. Um, we can still maintain our combat readiness throughout our pregnancy. So you can still work out your, throughout your pregnancy at fairly high level intensity. You can still lift weights. You can go for runs. But we are going to have to modify. Movement is not going to look exactly the same as pre-pregnancy. But there's really not like any like quote unquote like dangerous exercises um, outside of the ones that are going to really increase your fall risk. And it's all about the risk that you want to assume. Um, so during pregnancy, just focus on staying strong, moving however feels comfortable for you. Um, it's going to help to alleviate a lot of discomforts and probably decrease your risk of complications. And then early postpartum, we really want to focus on setting the stage for a long-term recovery. So taking our time with the healing, allowing our body to have that initial tissue healing. Um, and then like just slowly rebuilding from there. The more patient you are postpartum, the stronger you'll be, the faster you'll be um, in the long term. So we definitely recommend taking your time and allowing your soldiers the opportunity to take time as well. So this was definitely a quick overview on how to approach perinatal fitness. There's much more detail available to you online. Um, but yeah, thanks for being here. Gina, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are running short on time, so we're gonna. I'm gonna ask that in your lecture feedback, if you have any questions that you want answered, you can either let your instructor know, email them directly to me. We'll link you up with Mrs. Connolly if you have additional questions. Um, but I wanted to ensure that you give us that feedback about this lecture. And before you all leave, I wanted to formally recognize uh, Mrs. Connolly for joining us today. So on behalf of the United States Military Academy, the Department of Physical Education, our deputy commanders here, Colonel Wilson, uh, we wanted to present you with a certificate of appreciation and a DPE medallion uh, for joining us today to in empower these future leaders to know and better understand the families and the soldiers that they're gonna lead. Uh, so thank you very much. All right, so this concludes our lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, if you have the time, if you want to come up and talk to Mrs. Connolly, that's perfectly acceptable. But otherwise, you are dismissed to continue to your ER class. Thank you for being here. I didn't ask you that, but I didn't notice that I did something. I didn't notice it. It wasn't, she didn't even look at her time. And the only time that I had ever asked you for it was you. So then, yeah, but then whenever I saw it happen too, I was like, I'm just going to let it. I was going to let it. Yeah, but then when I saw it happen, I was like, Thank you.